Welcome to Counterpoint, where Iranian thought leaders and opinion makers, as well as non-Iranians working in the field of Iran, will tackle top currents and developments involving Iran, her society, her position on the global scene, explore where she may be heading, and options available to her. Joining me for our first program is Dr. Shahriya Rahi, a spokesperson for Iran Transitional Council, which is an organization for transition to democracy uh, in Iran. Dr. Aloya Kangalu, a physicist at the Department of Psychiatry at Columbia University. And Dr. Hassan Mansour, professor of economics at American Graduate School of Paris. Uh, welcome, gentlemen. Dr. Ahi, I first uh, turn uh, to you. And could you please give us a sense of what are the current trends and developments uh, regarding Iran? Where is Iran today? Well, to put it in context, uh, uh, Iran is uh, under authoritarian, ideological authoritarian, better call it totalitarian rule. And uh, totalitarian states have a, a lifespan. There are distinct phases in the life of a totalitarian state. They normally start with the revolutionary phase, when there's a new ideology and promises heaven on earth and solution of all the problems. And idealist youth join it. There is an explosion of pop participation. Uh, but after a while, they find that just because no ideology can answer all the problems of life in uh, the modern world, that it, it's not that uh, solve all, um, uh, total answer to all questions. Uh, the rate of acceptability falls from 90% to 70% to 50%. Uh, group of people within that system say, well, we've got to do some reform to pure ideology. The zealot tree doesn't work. Um, certain people disagree. They think that it's a threat to uh, the ideological system. So that's the second phase, the phase of, the phase of reform. Time goes on. Again, uh, the ideology doesn't allow you to just like a democracy, keep on adjusting your policies to the reality, changing realities of the world. Uh, and uh, popularity falters. Uh, uh, you, you go to 30%, 20% popularity. And this is when you have an aging totalitarian system. Uh, critical thing is that certain equations of political development reverse themselves from first phase to the third phase. The most important one, the relationship between uh, popularity or acceptability or legitimacy on the one hand uh, and, uh, and the, degree of part, uh, the degree of participation and the degree of legitimacy. Uh, if in the first phase, the greater the participation, the higher the legitimacy. That's why the revolutionary system always encouraged people to be out on the street and active. In the third phase, it's quite the opposite. If you allow maximum participation, it becomes quite visible that your legitimacy has tanked, has uh, minimized. That's where the Islamic Republic is right now. What does that mean? In a phase like this, they have to keep 90% of the population demobilized because they're a threat if they participate and only keep 10% mobilized. That means repression. That means more zealotry. That means, um, well, actually radicalization, uh, further radicalization. Um, and also one critical element is normally it becomes more important for a regime like that to export its revolution because it has to show its legitimacy outside of the world when people don't really understand the reality of life on the sort of a system, and it becomes uh, an additional threat to its region. That's where we are. Now, of course, the immediate issues impacting on Iran where uh, the bleeding of competence uh, alongside increased zealotry uh, has uh, uh, created conditions where socially, economically, um, 
the, the um, degradation has become such uh, that it's unsustainable. Uh, uh, Dr. Mansour can comment on this much better than I can, uh, but in the field of economics, there are trends that are simply not sustainable. The situation is so bad, it cannot get much worse. Or uh, social issues parallel to that. The immediate news that might impact that, uh, avidly watched inside Iran, is the US elections. Uh, they pin their hopes to uh, Joe Biden winning so that the policy of maximum pressure of uh, the Trump years vanishes. Maybe that'll give them a break. I don't think that it'll resolve the problems of Iran. And then its impact on the upcoming presidential elections in Iran. Uh, and I'm sure that the results in the US will impact the mood, the atmosphere in the elections in Iran, which promises to be one of the least popular elections ever because of where the Islamic Republic is. Um, so here we are. This is the current condition of Iran. Dr. Master. Um... Dr. Ahi noted that, uh, you know, the economic conditions are getting worse by the day. Uh, but, uh, and of course, Iran is, uh, was at the epicenter of COVID. And certainly, uh, COVID is ravaging uh, through the country, even though the numbers, the statistics that we get from World Health Organization uh, is not accurate. But it goes the same for the economy. So what is it, how can we make a sense of these numbers and what is going on in Iran? What are your views? Uh, well, the problems of Iran's economy, they are very, very deep-rooted. They go to the very foundations of economics. So uh, to begin with the property rights in Iran, which had been um, uh, tampered with and totally changed, uh, it has made the Iranian economy very, very unproductive. On the base of it, monopolies have grown and monopolies have become military and security monopolies. This is something which cripples Iran's structure and makes it non-responsive to economic stimulus. So this is the basic thing, that Iran's structure is a monopoly structure and monopoly in the hands of the uh, military and the security. That's, that's one thing. Uh, since then, we haven't had during the past 40 years any considerable growth. So the average growth comes to less than 1%. But during the past three, four years, we've been having negative growth. A growth of, for example, last, last year, a negative growth of 6% in GDP. And this year is also, uh, we, we are heading to a negative growth. Um, as to the complication coming from the side of the COVID is something which is the last straw which breaks the camel's back. Um, of course, as you mentioned, the statistics from Iran are not reliable. Um, it is something that even parliament said that the real numbers are about 10 times the size of the official numbers. And recently a minister said that uh, the real numbers are about two and a two and a half times for the disease. So this is a very complicated issue, an unfortunate issue. But Iran's um, the production is down. Unemployment is rising. According to the statistics and, and, and predictions made by the parliament, this year, maybe we're going to have about 6.4 6 million people losing their jobs, a country which is already crippled by unemployment. So compared to this unemployment, with the side of it, you have the inflation. Inflation which had been controlled by the Rouhani government during the first period of this time. Uh, later on, it gave up the reform for different reasons, structural reasons, and went back to the same channel of creating a liquidity and hence handling the question of the, the, the problem of uh, um, inflation. Now we have about, officially, about 30 to 35 percent inflation and an unemployment which is above again official figures 13 percent but in real terms are much higher so this is uh, compounded by another problem that is loss of forex or in exchange 
because Iran's trade has been locked. And according to the latest figures from IMF, Iran's official reserve have gone from $122 billion in two years ago to about $8.8 billion this year. This makes the government very tight-handed. They cannot handle their internal problems as well as their external commitments. To put it in a nutshell, the current Iranian budget has been in deficit. The um, estimates about the deficit varies from 30% to 50%. My estimate is that it was about 50% deficit. And in order to cover this deficit, they had to resort to central bank and, of course, other sources, which created more and more inflation. But now, once you come to foreign trade, you cannot pay your imports by your domestic currency. So you need foreign currency. And this currency is not forthcoming. This is why this is the first year that we are having a current account deficit this year, estimated by IMF to be about 20 billion. And running the statistics show something about 10, 15 billion up to now. So this has got to come from somewhere. And if it doesn't, then the government cannot make this importation. It is difficult. Then resort to the blocked exchanges in other countries. Um, in the face of reduction of the official reserves, the government has some blocked funds of about estimated $40 billion in different countries like China, India, South Korea, and, 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 and Iraq. They have been trying to snatch back some of it, whatever they can, but for different reasons, it's not forthcoming either. So there is no solution. There's no opening from that uh, the side. Now, add as a last point to this uh, question, the commitments and very important and urgent commitments of the uh, regime to its proxies beyond the borders. Those are the military who have put their own lives at stake. So they need their salaries. And this expenditure is quite colossal and, 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 and considerable. So Consider Iraq, consider uh, Yemen, Syria, Lebanon. So this becomes a priority for the government. Whatever income they receive, the primacy goes to uh, pay these forces, proxies, and later on spend it within the country. So this is a very, um, a very um, uh, difficult stalemate for the government now, and there is no solution aside as of yet. Uh, Dr. Kangalu, as uh, both Dr. Ahi and uh, Dr. Mansur mentioned, uh, it seems that the government and those uh, uh, elite uh, uh, in control of Iran's policies are in a way waiting to see uh, what will happen to uh, the U.S. presidential elections. Will President Trump get re-elected? Uh, or whether president, uh, there will be a President Biden and a return to JCPOA. Now, how likely is it that there will be what will happen in, in the U.S. presidential elections and how likely do you feel uh, it will affect whether there will be a JCPOA too or not? I don't think that the result of the American election has any impact on, uh, on the path of uh, Islamic Republic on self-destruction. I think uh, just like uh, my friends Dr. Ahi and Dr. Mansur uh, just uh, told you about the historic perspective and economic perspective of, uh, of the path to death in front of this government, in, in front of the Islamic Republic, uh, the external affairs, like uh, relationship, the friendship that the Islamic Republic is trying to establish with China or Russia, or the, the, the hay party that they're, they're launching in the entire Middle East, the wars, the proxy wars in Syria, in Lebanon, in Iraq, in Yemen, uh, it's not gonna help them. It can just prolong their life. But the more the life of this government is prolonged, the more tragic its departure and its death it would be. So uh, to put the, everything in the context of American election is really just another venue for this government to look for, for, a, 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 for a rope of help from anyone. You know, the government 
even the government officials are confessing to their total inability to to uh, conduct the affairs of a government. And this government, the, the group of this gang of criminals in power in Iran, uh, they cannot even be called a government. They don't uh, have any rules or any um, discipline in uh, following uh, international norms. You know, they're really uh, violating all the international laws by uh, by developing a secret uh, weapon uh, development uh, in probably in deserts in somewhere in Iran. And they are... Uh, they have turned a political party in Lebanon uh, into an armed group uh, parallel with the military in, in Lebanon, and, uh, and they're, they're causing a lot of instability, and they've turned the economy of uh, Lebanon, a country that was thriving 30 years ago before the, uh, before the assault by the Islamic Republic, uh, into a complete uh, dysfunctional government. I mean, today, Lebanon doesn't have a government. It's really a group of uh, armed uh, militia are ruling uh, that country and they have really destabilized that country and two three million people have really no certain future. So uh, the government of Iran cannot hope that Joe Biden will bring them any relief. They, I think the way that President Trump has uh, uh, really set the rules for, uh, for the, uh, uh, the way that the United States pulled out of the JCPOA uh, I don't think that uh, Joe Biden will uh, be able to easily reverse the clock and go back and reestablish it by the way Obama was doing business as usual with the government of Iran. Uh, I think uh, what we are facing in the Middle East, not just in Iran, but in the entire Middle East, and actually even broader than that, in the entire world of Islam, is a cultural war between Islam and the modern world. This is something that Christianity experienced in during enlightenment 500 years ago. You know, Christianity is a religion that is about 500 years older than Islam, and they went through this struggle, through this social chemotherapy of a religion. Anytime religion captures political power, it has to be able to run the affairs of society. And we know that religion, no religion is capable of running the affairs of a society, whether it's economic, social, cultural, or, or otherwise. And uh, the Islamists, in Iran or in the greater Middle East, they, they thought that their religion is something magic with the religion and they can do what the Christians failed to do in the 15th and 16th century. They can, and they miserably failed. And you see that what they're resorting to is re resorting to terrorism, killing that poor teacher in France and uh, assassinating opposition forces in all over the world. And uh, you know all, everything that we've seen Islam doing in the entire Middle East in general and in Iran in particular, is a really a desperate desire and a desperate effort to stay uh, uh, connected to the modern world. And they know very well, even the political leaders within the world of Islam and within the Islamic Republic know very well that they cannot handle the affairs of a, of a, of a country, let alone the affairs of an entire region. So I believe that uh, neither Joe Biden nor Trump will make a big difference as far as the uh, certain doomsday that awaits in the Islamic Republic in the near future. Uh, Dr. Ahi, uh, uh, Dr. Kangalu mentioned about uh, how Iran has changed, uh, especially its views, uh, the importance of religion, and uh, surveys that have been done point to a society that is becoming increasingly secular. Um, at the same time, other changes uh, have taken place, as he mentioned, including it's a sort of retreat from its previous positions of strength, uh, both uh, in the Middle East uh, and in North Africa. Um, how do you assess uh, what the whether um, the results, uh, how the results of the U.S. presidential elections? how it will affect uh, Iran. It seems that Iran uh, uh, is only positioning itself uh, as a pivot against one country. And uh, what will happen to that, please? Uh, please unmute yourself. Thank you. The question is, the uh, big question is whether the maximum pressure uh, policy of the Trump period will uh, continue, or if it changes, it changes in what fashion? Most critical question is whether more money is put into the hands of the Revolutionary Guard, whose mission is to oppress the Iranian people and export the revolution. Um, 
you know, like water lilies in springtime, articles are growing all over in the state. Oh, maximum pressure policy has not worked. What they're doing is they're comparing Trump's policies against Obama's goals, which were quite different. Obama's goal was single-mindedly focused on the nuclear issue. If you push back Iran from, let's say, having three, four months to build a bomb to a year, slightly more than a year to build a bomb, that's a success. And they spent all of the bullets, all the uh, instruments of le leverages that uh, US policy had, including crossing their own red lines, their own red line, credibility of the United States is concerned in Syria on the use of nuclear weapons just to appease Iran. Uh, but the Trump administration, the thought behind it, I'm not saying necessarily in the minds of President Trump himself, but uh, the, the policy group that came to manage the Iran policy was, uh, no, the nuclear thing is a subsidiary issue. The main problem is Iran's destabilizing activities in the region. If you didn't have a destabilizing Iran, you wouldn't have more of a problem with its nuclear weapons than Pakistan or India. So that is uh, what, what needs to be contained and controlled. And that, of course, depends on the level of resources that the Revolutionary Guards have to create mayhem. And as those resources were cut by maximum economic pressure, we've seen the result. I mean, the use in Iraq, in Lebanon, all sorts of places where Iran was uh, uh, exerting maximum influence were out on the streets uh, demonstrating against the Iranian uh, influence of the groups that are proxies for the Iran Revolutionary Guards. Iran's ability to create mayhem in the neighborhood from uh, Syria, Lebanon, all the way to Yemen, uh, even in Afghanistan, is drastically reduced. If you measure by that policy goal of Trump administration, maximum pressure policy has worked. Now, uh, Biden administration comes, uh, uh, if it does, uh, it will probably try to coordinate its policies more with Europeans, with its allies, which means uh, a movement towards JCPOW. It's very doubtful that it'll go back directly to JCPOW when some of the provisions expire in 2023, just two and a half years from now some of them in 2025, uh, to uh, allow um, all of the economic instruments in the hands of the revolution, Iran, which really means the revolutionary guards right now, uh, in exchange for something that's going to expire in two and a half years. So uh, cer certain critical issues uh, need to be re-examined. The principal one, which I hope the next US administration, whoever it is, has to ask themselves is, why does Iran want the nuclear weapon? It's not to use it, that's crazy. They know that uh, they're infinitely superior. If they have two bombs and another force in the, unnamed force in the Middle East has 300 bombs, you know, you're, you're not gonna get away with it. But it's because Iran's technological inferiority vis-a-vis -vis the West that it aims to fight makes her lose a high intensity conventional war. So it resorts to low intensity, call it asymmetric warfare. But it constantly has to deter escalation to high intensity, and that's why it wants the nuclear umbrella. Now, if you do a deal with Iran saying, I guarantee your security, they no longer need the bomb. If in the meantime, you give Iran all it wants in exchange for that, Iran has lost nothing. You've lost all the instruments of pressure needed for containment of Iran's destabilization efforts. I hope that fact 
will be paid attention to a lot more than under Obama administration, whoever comes to the White House. Uh, Dr. Mansour, um, one of, uh, of course, President Obama's goals was uh, focused on uh, containing Iran's nuclear capability, but it was also to provide uh, an impetus and encourage positive elements uh, who can bring a change of behavior in the Islamic Republic. Um, the, how do you see uh, those forces that President Obama and others, uh, quote unquote reformists, where are they today? And where, what, is, what prospects do they have for actually bringing about positive change for Iran? Well, as you mentioned, uh, from the vantage of the United States and its allies in this JCPOA, this agreement or whatever you want to call it, it was a beginning and both sides understood it. There were second steps, third step afterwards. So the main thing was the first to address the question of nuclear bombs. The second was to tackle the question of Iranian intervention in neighboring countries and non-neighboring countries, and so on and so forth. But from Iran's point, here I come to a, a, a deeper point, which may make a difference of analysis. The point is, well, analogies are rife about Iranian regime and the totalitarian Hitler's regime, the Stalin's regime. And I'm sure there are a great deal of comparable elements to be found among them. But there is also one difference. And that difference is that both of those regimes, totalitarians, they were the aberrations of the modern. They were regimes based on the foundations of reformation and renaissance. While Islamic Republic is a regime built on an older paradigm, which is pre-modern, and it has great deal of differences. So, from the point of view of Iran, that agreement, or whatever you want to call it, because it didn't have a name, it was a respite, a breathing point, in order to rejuvenate, re-strengthen itself to build up. This is why once we came to the second step and third step of this JCPOA called Barjam inside Iran, the leader said there is no second Barjam, there is no third Barjam. We stop there. So negotiations and proceedings stop there. This is a very important point. Now, I come to, it is just to explain very briefly. Once we're talking about the Islamist regime in Iran. We're talking about one utopian state which is surrounded by a real country's world. From the point of view of the beliefs and ideology, the Iranian regime is the truth. It is the real. The rest of the world surrounding it they are ephemeral, transitory. Let me tell you something which is funny. Once Soviet Union declared that Paris doesn't have a metro station. They don't have an underground system. Well, they knew that both in London and Paris, underground system was built early 20th century, some 30, 40 years before they were saying this. But what did they mean when they said the Moscow underground system is the only one in the world? They meant one thing, which is understandable and justifiable in accordance with the principles of the ideology, that this is the only underground which is going to survive. The others will be annihilated. So once the Islamist Republic enters into negotiations, it has its own principles. We have, heard a, we have heard this story great, great many times, that President Trump has said Iranians were cheating. 
while Europeans, Chinese, Russians, have, and IEA, they have said no. They were compliant. So where is the truth? Yes, they do comply, but they do not comply. So this is the important point. They would comply with the letters. They would not comply with the soul. Because the soul is a part of the ideology. It is the belief. You talk about two countries or two people. They have a difference. They want to negotiate. What is the objective of this negotiation? It is find a middle way and compromise. Once you have an ideology, there is no compromise. You cannot compromise on your beliefs and principles. The compromise is to buy time and a respite to postpone it. Otherwise, you wouldn't. Now, take many, many examples. No time. I only mention one. Look, on the motto and the, the flag of the Revolutionary Guards, they write this verse from Quran saying that equip yourself to the highest weaponry in the world to cast terror into the heart of your adversaries. All right. In the meantime, the issue of fatwa, to which, unfortunately, a president of the United States like President Obama makes a reference, saying that Ayatollah has issued fatwa. This is to fall into that trap. 1,000 fatwas, they do not have the value of a verse from the holy work, holy book. So the aim would not change. The aim would be to procure the nuclear bomb. Dr. I mentioned that if you say that, well, this and this, so you wouldn't need, we secure, we give you security um, a commitment, and you wouldn't need the nuclear bomb. But they will again try to get the nuclear bomb. Why? Because it is an instrument of casting terror into the hearts of your adversaries. And the adversary is well defined in the holy book. So why Iran sits there in, in Iran, its own country, and extends, stretches its long arm into Syria and Beirut? Isn't that to surround Israel? Well, the adversary is very well defined. Whatever they do and whatever they say, the goal of annihilating Israel will remain. So even if they have no power to annihilate, but they can threaten, cause terror into the hearts. So a final point. Once you negotiate with such a country and their leaders, well, do they believe in what they say and what they sign? Well, again, if you do not know the soul of this regime, if you do not know the holy verses of this regime, if you do not know the tradition of 1,400 years, and if you do not know their jurisprudence, you, you would not be able to judge because they have a right to lie to you, to put a signature, in the meantime, believe that they're going to violate it. They can swear oath. In the meantime, they know they're going to violate it because they are not questioned according to the texts. They are not questioned for violation of their oath. They are questioned for violation of their real intentions. And real intentions are only in the heart. And only God knows the real intention. So I give you signature and I imply something while my real intention is something else. This is why the chances of getting into any viable agreement with the Islamist re Republic in Iran are very meager. There is a question of negotiation and later on controls. This is there. But if you think that they admit it, they will never do it unless they have in, the, in their, uh, they eradicate in their beliefs or change the system, which they cannot, 
they will follow their own goals and stick to it. And cheating is quite admissible and acceptable. Uh, Dr. Kangalu, uh, of course, uh, Dr. Masur explained uh, where the state of the mind of the elite, of the leaders of Iran uh, is. Uh, from your experience, as far as uh, Iranians are concerned, and spe specifically those outside of Iran, uh, there's, a, there's a difference between uh, their worldview and what their aspirations are, and what is happening inside Iran. Am I uh, right in thinking that? Do you see it the same way? Well, in, uh, you're right. Actually, uh, in terms of, uh, I can tell you that the popularity of uh, President Trump in Iran is very high. Uh, while Iranians outside Iran, uh, their uh, President Trump might not be as popular, for instance, among the Iranians outside Iran, because the majority of them are highly educated and you know they're left leaning rather than uh, judging the presidential candidates of the American presidency uh, uh, in terms of uh, a single issue of Iran's interest and support and 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 the and the policies that can lend stability to the regime in Iran. So these are these are the things that uh, are very important as far as the uh, as far as the, the difference the discrepancy between the opinions of the Iranians inside Iran and outside Iran is concerned. But what what is important, you know, is really uh, the fact that uh, Iran has a regime ruling over it that uh, its national interest, every other country in the world, its national interest, and is closely tied with the survival of the regime. And therefore regimes, by pursuing their survival, they're really pursuing the national interest. In Iran, there is a regime that has an entirely different consideration and aspiration than Iran's national interest. In fact, the government officials repeatedly and publicly declare that they are not pursuing Iran's national interest, and they're pursuing the interest of what they call Islamic community, the world Islamic community, what they refer to as Oman. Therefore, their survival and their interests and their aspirations are in conflict, a 180 degree conflict with the, uh, with the national interests of Iran. Any regime that puts itself in conflict with the national interest is doomed to fail and, and doomed to die. And, and uh, they, they will they re eventually be uh, thrown into the dustbin of history. That's, that's the doomsday scenario that I see for this regime. And there is no evading that. Nuclear power will not do that. The conflict, this artificial conflict that they have created with the United States and with Israel is not going to solve that. Israel is a super, at least is a regional superpower, is a technological power, is an economic power, is a military power. And now with the, with the uh, policies that uh, uh, President Trump has pursued in his first term of establishing ties between Israel and some of the Muslim countries in the region, like the United Arab Emirates and Bahrain and now Sudan, I think, I think that taboo has broken. Now Israel, most of the Arab countries in the Middle East are now viewing Islamic Republic in Iran as their primary enemy. And they, don't, they no longer view Israel as their enemy. So the conflict with Israel between Israel and the Arab countries is, is about to be dissolved. And that is a big blow to this uh, conflict reason policies that the Islamic Republic has been pursuing in the last 40 years. And the Islamic Republic has lost its credibility even in the eyes of the people who are um, traditionally pro-Palestinian uh, uh, policies. And therefore, really, the United, uh, Islamic Republic, to the confession of its own officials, has no friends around the world or in the region. And, and now this, all of these issues, all of this erratic behavior that they are, uh, they are exhibiting around the world and in Iran is because of that, because they are really desperate in guaranteeing their survival. They see right in front of their eyes that they are really falling apart and the economy, their popularity, their stability, even their aspirations, their philosophical aspirations, the love of Islam, all of that, you know, they have been displaced even in, among the faithful and among the uh, Muslim believers inside Iran and outside Iran. Therefore, I think, I think uh, the, the death of this regime is inevitable. And uh, the policies, uh, as far as the, your specific question about the, the relevance of the uh, American election to the survival of the regime is concerned, I think the policies are, that uh, President Trump has put in uh, stone in the last uh, three and a half years, in the last four years, 
uh, has made a conflict between the between the Western world, between the free world, specifically between the United States and Islamic Republic, irreversible. This cannot be solved unless this regime accepts certain principles within that 12 item uh, declaration that Secretary Pompeo uh, declared. And if the government consents to accepting those 12 items, I think the government has dissolved itself by by accepting those. They know very well that they cannot, they are not in a position to accept. Uh, uh, any, give any concessions to those two principles, establishing ties with Israel, uh, pulling all the forces outside all the foreign countries, this Syria, Iraq, and, and Lebanon, and stopping being belligerent towards Israel and towards the West, and, and all of that. Uh, uh, following human rights, respect for human rights inside the country, and calling all the assassins and terrorists from, a, from abroad. None of this. This government thrives on those principles, on those 12 items, and, and any regime, any government, Biden administration or Trump administration, they cannot get this government to abide by those 12 principles, to, be, to behave in a normal fashion, in a way that all the normal countries and the normal governments in the world are behaving. Therefore, I think the government is really doomed to follow its erratic behavior, its terrorist policies, and its suppression of masses, and its conflict with the modern and every aspect of modernity until the last day of its uh, its life as a government. Uh, Dr. Ahi, uh, in this round of questions, and I, I would like to wrap it up after that, um, I want to look to the future. I mean, certainly, um, Dr. Kangarlu mentioned human rights. Uh, human rights hasn't figured a lot in, um, uh, in, in the past few years, past four years, as far as Iran is concerned. And also, we have seen a schism between Europe and the United States as uh, far as their policies towards Iran is concerned. Um, as where you are sitting and you're in touch with a lot of political groups inside and outside, and you have the pulse uh, of this uh, movement, uh, uh, you can feel it. Can you tell us how do you see where Iran is heading and whether it will, uh, whether Europe and the United States can at some point have a, uh, a position, a common position in support of human rights in Iran? Well, uh, first I'd like to amend something that, uh, without disagreement, amend something that uh, Dr. Mansour said. Um, about uh, uh, you, you, it implied you can't deal with Iran because of its ethos, because of its ideology, uh, it will always lie. It's in the gene of Islamic theocracy that they would lie. I would say uh, in diplomacy in general, you don't trust the other side not to lie. That's why you build in verification. Uh, that's why you build in strong sanctions if verification shows that you haven't done what you said you would do. I mean, this, this is part and parcel of democracy, and it's not an exception of the United uh, of, of Iran. This ideological or totalitarian state to want a respite. I mean, the Molotov von Ribbentrop agreement was a respite by both sides. Salt one was a respite. We now know what the Russians were saying. They all want eventual victory of their ideology. And they buy time. But the control mechanism from the other side has to be uh, strong. Now, if you say plain and simple, you can't have an agreement with Iran because Iran will not abide by it because it lies. Uh, I think the record shows the opposite in the case of J.C. Paul. All three European states, major powers, Britain, France, Germany, not just Russia or China, even IEA itself said Iran complied with the agreement and you, the US broke it. I mean, that's a fact. If you're talking about unreliability, clearly the US had been more unreliable on JC Power than Iran. Everybody except for Trump says that. Uh, but uh, you, you, you have to make sure that you've got a very strong verification policy and very strong sanctions. 
And if you do both, then I, I doubt very much that Iran would go ahead and build a bomb. Because they would be sure that if the verification system is strong, that it'd be discovered. And if the sanctions are strong, they'd be sure that there'll be a Western or Israeli attack on the Iran uh, nuclear facilities before they build a bomb or just around that time. I mean, that would be a successful agreement. That would be successful deterrence. It's not based on faith that you're a good guy, you accept by what you say. That's not the way diplomacy works. Now, back to your question of human rights. Uh, I think there is a huge struggle opening up again, despite Fukuyama and the end of history, again, between two kinds of forces, forces of liberal democracy, respect for human rights, uh, uh, popular sovereignty, and forces that are against it in the world. And it'll probably manifest itself post-COVID in the US-China rivalry, not US-Russia rivalry. And the strongest weapon as well as ideal, as well as the basis of having a civilized society is human rights. It's the biggest vulnerability of the other side. And Western democracies would shoot themselves in the foot not to make that a huge element of their strategy, basing their policies on that, because then they will forget the greatest vulnerability of an enemy of democracy and human rights that should not win. Dr. Masur, what are your thoughts? What are the trends we should also be looking for? I mean, uh, we should be looking at. You're talking about the human rights question. Human rights, uh, yes, and also what trends uh, should we be looking uh, for inside the country to see where at least, where the country and its capabilities are heading? Right. Uh, well, as to human rights, let's again make a comparison. Hitler's regime and Stalin's, they, didn't, they did not respect human rights. Of course, then, then, then we didn't have the Charter. But human rights is spirit. It wasn't respected. But there's a difference between them and the Islamic Rep Republic of Iran. Because in Iran, human has an ideological definition. It is not physically inviolable. You can lash human beings in the streets. Look, you can hang him. You can shoot him. You can knife him. You can behead him according to the holy texts. So that's a definition of human. So once you talk about find, I mean, I've written an article about it, find one single article out of the Charter of Human Rights that the Islamist Republic does not violate. Article three on life, liberty, security, and of a person is systematically violated. Article 5 on torture and subjection to human and degrading punishment. It's daily practice. Article 9 on arbitrary arrest. That is more than normal. Article 12 on arbitrary intervention with privacy. Article 17 on right to own property and the prohibition of arbitrary deprivation of one's property. You even today have the revolutionary courts which expropriate anybody's property without compensation. Article 18 on freedom of thought, conscience and religion, including the right to change your religion. You know the people who are persecuted in Iran for their religions and you change your religion, then you are doomed to death and so on and so forth. So this is the question. The difference, if we do not see the difference, between a Pinochet regime who does not respect human rights and the Islamist regime 
who does not respect human rights. This was an ideology for not respecting the human rights. The other one doesn't. So you pressurize and you put a system of sanctions and verification, as Dr. Ahi mentioned, then of course they will retreat. But if these people retreat, they will do their torturings in private and hidden. Because that's what they believe in. So this is the basic question. Uh, so far as the same principle is staying, you can't have an improvement. You can have verification and pressure. So far as the control goes, they will have the semblance of obeying and abiding by the rule. Otherwise, they wouldn't do it because they don't, they don't believe in it. So which law in the country, in any country, accepts rape? It is a very common practice in Iranian practices, raping of women, men, adults, and children. It is a common practice, right? Because there is a belief in it. It is ideologically indoctrinated in the system. So this about the human rights question. Human rights can proceed so far as there is resistance and the people and campaigners of human rights are organized and push the regime back. And they're very much more organized nowadays, aren't they? They are getting more and more organized, of course. And this consciousness of rights is now, is now growing in Iran. It has become more and more common. So this is the hope. So far as this one goes, then the system will retreat because they never declare that they will do it. So once they are powerless, they're a minority, they will pretend to be lovers of human beings, respectful of women, respectful of children. It is when they are in power, they show their true face. So uh, as to the future of Iran, I mean, that's very about Iran's immediate economic prospects. Yes. Now, strangely, the American election has become the most important event in the annals of Iran, Iran today. Without having any concrete plan, we know the scenarios. They have, they have written up scenarios, one, two, three scenarios. If Biden comes, if Trump comes, if Trump, Biden comes and continues the sanctions. So different scenarios. Right. But do they have a plan of controlling the Corona, Corona crisis? No. Do they make an investment? No. Have they created a structure to do that? No. What about their economic problems? How do they intend to, to solve the problems? Do they do it? No. The point is, whenever you come, we have experienced how many times do we need to experience the first round of Mr. Rouhani's government came with the agenda of reform. And the reform was to control the inflation first. He did abide by the advice of his good advisors for three years. And the inflation was brought down from 44% to 9%. Later on, due to the visible and understandable pressures, he left that reform path and started creating liquidity again. And before that, when it came to the question of reforming the monopolistic structures of the economy, he was resisted by the leader and the Revolution Guards. So he gave up. So that problem is growing and growing every day. And Iran is in the grip of a military monopoly. So with the monopoly, you have no way of reforming it. So uh, we've got to see what the future holds. I do not expect that any government generated by the system will be able to do this. The problems persist. And I don't see anything but the real change of the same system until a reform program can be implemented. Dr. Kangalu, how do you, you are a professor at uh, the Department of Psychiatry. Uh, 
Put yourself in the heads of Mr. Rohani and the leaders right now. How, how, how what are they, what kind of uh, uh, character, how would you define uh, what is going on in them mentally? Uh, and what can one expect? How can they, how can Iranians actually, because Iran is uh, from, uh, statistics uh, show us, is a depressed country. Uh, the people have no hope. Um, the government obviously has no hope. Uh, it's very silent on a lot of priorities that, uh, as far as budgeting, as far as providing services, where do they go from here? I don't think you need to be a psychologist or a psychiatrist to uh, to be able to figure out the uh, Iranian regime's uh, policies and understanding and philosophy. They are driven by an ideology, by a bankrupt ideology, by an antiquated ideology, uh, that uh, all of its principles, as Dr. Mansour was just laying them down, are written in a holy book. And they are conducting the affair of the government with the verses of Quran, a text that was written 14th century ago. And they're hoping that they should they would be able to solve the modern problems with a verse that has, according to them, anticipated all the modern world problems. And they see that, you know, from uh, camp to camp, from battle to battle, from war to war, they are failing every aspect of modern life. And their solution for these modern problems are inadequate and a failure and a total and utter failure. Dr. Ahi made a very good reference to... Um, to Francis Fukuyama's book on uh, and the, the end of the history and the last man. It's uh, actually a very relevant issue. The book that uh, Fukuyama write, wrote is very relevant to our discussion, the discussion we're having today. Uh, Fukuyama was a graduate student uh, uh, of uh, Samuel Huntington. He did his PhD in Harvard under Huntington. Huntington was one of the most astute observers of politics and sociology uh, in modern time, in my view. Uh, in his book, uh, the advisor's book, Samuel Huntington's book, Clash of Civilizations, he anticipated that after the downfall of Soviet Union and the defeat of the socialist camp by the capitalist camp, uh, the world will go to the next conflict because history is written in terms of conflicts. And because history cannot stop, then the next conflict would be the conflict between the capitalist world, the free world, and the world of Islam. And that was the topic of, the, uh, of his uh, book on clash of civilization. His graduate student, Fukuyama, uh, took a more radical approach to the same problem, to the problem that his advisor saw as a conflict between the Western world and the, uh, and the Islamic world. He basically, in so many words stated that the, the Islamic world is really no match for the, for the philosophy of liberal democracy. As such, liberal, liberal democracy has won the philosophical war and the economic war by default. And as such, the, uh, the, the history will end. And that was the topic and the discussion of, of Fukuyama's book. I happen to agree with that. I think uh, what uh, uh, Huntington referred to as civilization Islam, present day Islam, there was a time that Islam had a civilization. Today, Islam does not have a civilization. It doesn't have a civilization in the philosophical term. It doesn't have a civilization in technological term. It doesn't have a civilization in economic term or military term. Therefore, there is no civilization to have a conflict with. The conflict is from the point of view that I referred to earlier. It is a conflict within the world of Islam it is a chemotherapy of Islam that the Islamic world is going through in order to adapt itself with the changes, with the modern aspect of life, with the, with the individual right, with human right, with the human dignity, all the new philosophy and the new religion of the modern world. And the Islamic world eventually, after so many years, perhaps 10, 20, 30, perhaps even a century of internal conflict solution and internal war with each other, right now you can see that the conflict between, within the camp of Islam, between Islamic Republic of Iran and Saudi Arabia is more severe and more irreconcilable than the conflict between Saudi Arabia and Israel and between Iran and Israel. Therefore, you can see that this conflict is really within the world of Islam. Of course, it will spill over and it will have an external manifestation, like the way that Islamic Republic constantly uh, uh, 
criticizes the US government or the Western government in general, European governments in general, and has really turned this internal conflict into an external conflict. There is no way that Islam will continue business as usual until it reforms itself, until is, uh, political Islam is disbanded and it pushed to the private realm of the people's belief and faith. It, Islam has no, the same way that Christianity had no space in political arena in Europe of the 16th and 17th century and eventually with the, with the wars and the struggles of the Europeans and Christians in primarily, it was driven to the privacy of the peoples of the Christian homes uh, in Europe and in, and in the Christendom basically. Islam will have the same destiny. It, it, is, it is really destined for the same eventuality. And yes. Islam will eventually become a modern religion as a matter of personal conviction and private belief of the, of the believers. And it will have no, no way of ever capturing political power because it showed how miserably it has failed everywhere from, from Daesh, from uh, ISIS that tried to capture power in, in, uh, uh, in Iraq and Syria. And we saw how savage they, they behaved and how beheading, all the public beheading and all the atrocities that, that uh, Daesh committed in Syria and in Iraq to the Islamic Republic and the public hanging torture and everything that Dr. Mansour just uttered from, it comes directly from the verses of the Holy Book. Therefore, the modern world cannot accept the political Islam in, in Iran, in Lebanon, in Syria, in Afghanistan, anywhere. Forces like Islamic Republic and Taliban and ISIS they are on the losing side of history, on the losing side of time, and their time will, will pass, you know, regardless of who they ally with, whether they ally with China or Russia or whatever they do. Even China and Russia themselves, they cannot afford to ignore their interests when it comes to dealing with the United States. You can see what's happening right now. You know, they, uh, uh, J when JCPOA was agreed in 2015, it was turned into a, a resolution of the United Nations, a UN resolution. It was confirmed by the US resolution, um, uh, National Secu the uh, 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 Security Council of the, uh, of the United Nations. Uh, but when the terms of the JCPOA came to expire, which actually expired on the 20th of October, the uh, Islamic Republic was jubilant that, you know, that one of the terms of the, of the JCPOA, which turned into a UN resolution was the banning of Iran from buying and selling weapons. And Iran was really, because of the fact that, you know, their policy is primarily based on selling arms to the terrorist groups in Middle East and around the world, they were really looking forward. They were counting minutes for the expiration of the JCPOA term, according to the UN Resolution 1921. And, uh, and uh, the United States, what the United States did under Trump administration was that they take the argument to the UN Security Council that Iran uh, cannot, has been in violation of the JCPOA. Therefore, they have to extend the terms of the banning on the sale and purchase of the weapons. Uh, basically, everybody else in the Security Council voted against the United States and the United States stood alone, opposing the expirations of the terms of the JCPOA. What happened as a result? China and Russia took sides with their proxy, with the ally, the Islamic Republic in Iran. But the United States single-handedly managed to dissuade any government from violating the US desire. This is not really a UN resolution anymore because it wasn't agreed upon by, all, by the members of the uh, Security Council, but the United States single-handedly managed to impose its will on Russia and China. There we go. Therefore, the, if Islamic Republic is hoping that in alliance with China and Russia, they would be able to counter the weight of the US economy and the US politics and the US reputation and moral leadership around the world, they are really barking the wrong tree. They can uh, never ever match the, uh, the, the United States uh, in the conflict that they've taken with the United States. Therefore, I don't see any hope for the Islamic Republic to ever being able to dig itself out of the well that has fallen. Dr. Ahi, I would like to end by uh, the state of Iran go back to Iran and its people uh, and uh, certainly the civil society the political society there's been a renewed energy and vigor around uh, in the past uh, year or so more uh, well actually it started inside Iran with the protests and we are seeing its reverberations outside in the activity on the internet in the interconnectedness 
of the Iranian people through internet. And where do you see, how do you see the trends there and where we'll be going? And after that, it will be the end of our program because we're nearly an hour long. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nazanin. Uh, let, let me go back to Iran, the most important thing and the condition of the Iranian people. And uh, the greatest pain they all feel, univer universally, everybody in Iran, except for a very, very few corrupt officials, is the economic pressure. It's, it's uh, um, I, I was hoping I would learn more from Dr. Mansour, who knows more about it than I do, why the current situation is unsustainable. I will just say a couple of words on that. The Ahmadinejad government created seven, six times the money accumulated since 100 years ago by pumping liquidity by various means. Liquidity in Iran was about seven times when Ahmadinejad left compared to when he came to power. As Dr. Mansour said, Rouhani stopped that by going low, lower in inflation. They went from over 40 to under 10. After a short while, he discovered something he didn't know. He, he hadn't really realized how bankrupt the banking system was. What that meant was that he had to pump liquidity again into the banking system for it not to collapse entirely by various mechanisms. Now there's a for formula, M1 liquidity is equal to one over reserve requirements of commercial banks times the base currency. If you essentially put away those reserve requirements by lending money, central bank lending money to the banks, that means that that reserve requirement comes to zero. So potential growth of the money supply goes to infinity. Of course, it doesn't reach that potential, but there's very little instruments of controlling it and it keeps on growing, particularly when the real interest rate is very low. And so now Rouhani government liquidity is five times about five times when they took over. So he's created four times more than uh, on top of the seven, six times, seven times more than Ahmadinejad. This is unsustainable. It's got to the uh, important uh, equation of uh, an economy of P equals MV. Uh, the, the liquidity in Iran right now is almost equal, very, very, very similar to the total GDP. That means V, the productive velocity of money is one. In a normal healthy economy is four and a half to five, like the United States. It's unsustainable. You, you, cannot, have, you cannot have an economy survive that consistently the velocity of money is one, that liquidity is equal to the GDP. It's an explosive situation. The minute this money starts moving, the inflation skyrockets. Everything becomes unsustainable. So that's where we are. What is the solution? I don't think that the United States with the change of policy can do anything. Uh, I hope situation doesn't get as bad as war. I definitely don't want any foreign power to attack my country. Uh, I hope the solution will come from inside Iran. And I'm sure it will, because the growth of frustration, the level to which this spring of compression has been pressed is such that you will go back to Gandhi's statement about the Brits in India when he said, uh, uh, so many British troops, 80,000 British in India cannot stand up to 300 million people. Uh, 140,000 Revolutionary Guards will not be able to contain 84 million Iranians. And uh, the only question is, does the clock of creating a reasonable alternative that could create, control, a new legitimate order moves as fast as the collapse of the Islamic Republic? I hope so, because that collapse will not last long. Well, on that note, uh, I think we need to wrap up uh, the discussion. 
and I hope uh, uh, in other sessions we can uh, look at topics, bring in um, other speakers uh, and experts, and uh, just uh, hopefully uh, we'll meet here again very soon. Thank you very much for accepting my invitation, and uh, I hope to, we can get together very soon.